Hello, everybody. I'm Eric Hetzel, the Director of Land Protection and Public Grants here at Willistown Conservation Trust. Thank you for joining us this evening for our program, Legacy of the Land, a History of Land Conservation. Just a few words about our program format. We're using the Zoom webinar platform tonight. You can enter questions at any time into the chat box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. And we'll open the floor and bring all the attendees into the discussion. With us here tonight is Bonnie Van Allen, co-founders and the executive director of Willistown Conservation Trust, and Alice Hausman, another co-founder and one of the original trustees. As the program unfolds, Bonnie will tell us about the early days of conservation in the Willistown countryside and involved in those early efforts. Then Alice will talk about some of the first landowners who, by example, in donating conservation easements on their property and how they came to be known as heroes of the countryside. Next, Bonnie will explain how the Willistown Conservation Trust came to be as its own organization dedicated to protecting land. Finally, Alice and Bonnie will tell us how the strong foundation of land protection and our preserves have formed the basis for our scientific and educational programs and how Willistown Conservation Trust has evolved into an organization that does so much more than just protect land through conservation easements. So with that, I'll turn it over to Bonnie. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. The history of land conservation in the Willistown area spans the past 40 years. It is a story of many hundreds of people caring deeply for the land with a passion for protecting it, not just for open space, but to preserve the rich natural resources of our woodlands, rolling fields, and stream valleys to benefit wildlife, and to welcome and share with people of all ages and backgrounds a deep connection with nature. And it is a story that could not have happened without the loyal support, both moral and financial, of so many, for which all of us at the Trust are eterni eternally grateful. We think of this 40-year history in essentially four segments. The first being the early years under the umbrella of the Brandywine Conservancy in the 1980s. The second being the, uh, beginning with the official formation of the Willistown Conservation Trust in 1996. The third being our work through the early 2000s and the fourth, the evolution of our robust outreach programs over the past 14 years, starting with the creation of Russian Farm in 2008. So the story began way back in 1980 when Jim and I had just moved to our little farm on Plumsock Road and were happily raising our three boys there. At that time, the Willistown countryside was pretty rural, but it was clear that development was coming in from every direction. If someone did not do something, we would be swallowed up by the suburban sprawl that was happening at that time. I heard from a friend uh, that the Brandywine Conservancy was using this wonderful tool called a conservation easement to help landowners plan for the future of their lands. So I traipsed on down to Brandywine and met with Frolic Weymouth. There's Frolic. The upshot was that together we formed a satellite program under the Brandywine umbrella that we called the Willistown Area Conservation Program. We identified as our program area, the oasis of open space that was thought of as the Radnor Hunt country and was also defined by the important headwaters of three creeks, the Crum, Ridley and Darby creeks. It encompassed all of Willistown Township and parts of uh, East Town, New Town, Edgemont and East Goshen Townships, totaling approximately 28,000 acres. At that point, my good friend, Kathy McCoy joined me and with some trepidation, we began approaching local landowners to talk about conservation easements. There is Kathy. Those first landowners who stepped up were the brave ones, as it was a big decision to be the first to restrict your land, knowing that the land next door could be developed. Those early easement donors were the original heroes of the countryside, whose commitment to preserving the lands they loved formed the basis for where we are today. Names like Francis Ellen Paul, Ellen Mary and Henry Meggs, and the Lysenring, Strubridge, and Van Allen families, among many others. So, Kathy and I were only two years into our efforts when a subdivision plan was submitted to the township to build 80 houses on the property familiarly known as the 100 acre field. It was really 220 acres on Sugartown Road. 
Kathy and I were wet behind the ears when it came to what to do, but our friend and neighbor, attorney Peter Summers, came to the rescue and helped us form a limited partnership of 14 investors to acquire and hold the property until we could find conservation-minded buyers to resell it to. This was a critical moment because had that key property been developed, Betty Moran, who owned the neighboring 100-acre horse farm, would have moved away, and both public water and sewer would have been brought into the heart of the countryside, creating a snowball effect in definitely the wrong direction. Happily, the outcome was the preservation and sale of the property in five large parcels, including what is now the 25-acre square field preserve, owned by Brandywine and with an easement to WCT. And best of all, we were able to return all of our investors' funds so that many of these friends and neighbors have been willing to invest in subsequent projects. The 100-acre field project completed the first of 16 community conservation partnerships. The 16th was just completed this summer, resulting in the preservation of the 17-acre Stonehenge Farm on Plumsock Road. All in all, these 16 community conservation partnerships represent nearly $100 million in acquisition costs and the preservation of 2,000 acres that would have otherwise succumbed to development. What an amazing testament that is to this remarkable community. Following the 100 acre field project, Peter Hausman and I were approached by the Ashton family who had decided to sell their 450 acre Delchester farm, founded by Goshen Road on the north, Delchester Road on the east. Garrett Mill Road on the west and Route 3 on the south. A spectacular property that under township zoning could have supported 240 residential units. The family offered us the opportunity to purchase an option on the property, which gave us time to create a conservation plan, dividing it into large parcels, take the plan through subdivision, and to find conservation-minded buyers for each parcel. In the end, wonderful buyers purchased and preserved five large parcels and the 190-acre Okahocking Preserve that so many enjoy today with walking and with their dogs uh, down along Route 3 was sold to Willistown Township. This happened with funding from the Township Open Space Fund, the Chester County Preservation Partnership, and the PA Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. It was the Delchester Farm Project all the way back in 1985 that began the long and wonderful relationship with Peter and Alice Hausman. Ever since then, Alice has been my sidekick through thick and thin, spending a good deal of that time trying to keep me and Peter out of trouble, and with her kind and thoughtful persuasiveness, encouraging many additional landowners to preserve their own properties. Alice, I know you want to talk about a couple of those special landowners. I sure do. <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody, for coming. We, we really love seeing all of you here. There are so many wonderful families who helped us get started, and a lot of strong women. I wanted to talk to you about just two. The first one who comes to mind is our very wise and brilliant neighbor, Frances Ellen Paul, who was a passionate environmentalist well before her time. She was a member of the Willistown Friends Meeting, an avid reader, an advocate for the natural world, and a great gardener as well. Frances Ellen and her family were among the earliest easement donors. In 1985, she preserved her beautiful 53-acre property on Marlboro Phone, F Road, excuse me, known as Featherfield Farm. She worked through all the details of the easement with the support of her children and managed to accommodate her family, family's needs and desires for future generations. Frances Ellen's persuasive personality resulted in another community supported project contiguous to Featherfield Farm. It is known as Marlboro Farm, a 70 acre property in the heart of the countryside. This was in 1988 and the community's fourth partnership. None of this could have happened without the support of neighbors and friends. A public auction had been scheduled to sell the property, and fortunately, several neighbors provided the financial ba uh, backing to make it happen so we could make a bid. For better or worse, 
our area had started attracting attention from several developers who saw an advantage to building next to an eased property. This was not the anticipated consequence of those community members who had truly developed a conservation ethic in saving the land for the betterment of all the water resources, the habitat, the pollinators, and of course our visual beauty. So we were one of four bidders with three developers bidding against us. On the day of the auction, <clears throat> there may have been two things influencing the outcome. The first thing that is that we met at Francis Ellen's to have a good luck drink before we walked over to the auction site, which was staged on the bank bar barn at Marlboro Farm. We arrived with high hopes, but a little trepidation as well. The sun was beginning to set. This, the second influence was that the auctioneer surprised us by changing the format of the bidding process from the overall price to price per acre, forcing my husband Peter, who was doing the bidding, to have to, have to calculate on the spot. The sun was going down and it became more difficult to read the solar calculator. Fortunately, Jim Van Allen came to the rescue with his excellent math skills. There were a few frantic moments, however. I think Bonnie remembers all that quite well. It was quite frightening. <laughs> um, but despite the intense bidding from the developers, we managed to prevail and we won the bid. Alice, what you forgot to say was that the light was going down and we ran out of light, but also we managed to just keep on bidding, um, not knowing how much we were bidding. And we ended up paying more per acre than any anyone had ever paid in Chester County before. <laughs> oh, well, oh, sorry. got sorry. the job done. Okay. Um, the outcome was fantastic. The partnership resold the land and an easement was donated to the Brandywine Conservancy. Once again, our community had stepped up and recognized the greater good that extends to more than just the individual landowner, but to the precious resources that have no property lines like water, habitat, and wildlife. Indeed, the good luck drink and our North Star, Francis Ellen, gave us the promised good fortune. And there, that's one of my favorite pictures of Frances Ellen with her dogs. It's so wonderful. Meanwhile, while pursuing these alternative means of acquiring an easement, we were working with landowners on many other properties to donate easements on their land without the drama of an auction or the need for community intervention. One of the early easements was donated by the Meggs family. This is another extraordinary family and another extraordinary woman, Ellen Mary Meggs. The Meggs family lived on a 158 acre property called Crumdale Farm on Grubbs, Grub Mill and Whitehorse Roads. Ellen Mary was another passionate conservationist whose family had a long history at Crumdale Farm. Although Henry loved the farm and the area, he and Ellen Mary were a bit at odds with what the future of the farm might be. Henry was a well-respected and strong influence within our community, but, but was not without an opinion about how Ellen Mary should handle the ultimate disposition of her family farm. Ellen Mary made it clear that she wanted to donate a con conservation easement on her property. Occasionally, she would actually sneak up to the, to the blacksmith shop and to the office to discuss this and at least on one occasion, Henry discovered that she was speaking to Bonnie on the phone and interrupted the call. Another time when Bonnie returned Ellen Mary's call, he said she was just not available. Ultimately, as in all good marriages, Ellen Mary prevailed and with great care and deliberation with Henry and their family, the easement was signed and donated. Henry came through and as Bonnie says, he may have realized that he had met his match with Ellen Mary. After her death, the property was sold and is now under the good stewardship of four local families who all own parts of Crumdale Farm. 
and it is preserved in perpetuity. There are so many other landowners who have wonderful stories and have generously donated an easement on their land. During this early period, these 90 easements gave the community the confidence to do more and urged us on. Bonnie's gonna tell you about this next phase. So as Alice told, Alice told the story so well, by the mid 1990s, we had worked with more than 90 wonderful landowners who took the bold step of donating conservation easements to the Brandywine Conservancy. During that time, the two of us were raising our, our own funding, creating the conservation plans for landowners and essentially acting like our own land trust. So with the blessing of the Brandywine and the support and, and encouragement of our community, we founded the Willistown Conservation Trust in 1996 as an independent 501c3 charitable land trust. By doing this, we assured that there would be a conservation organization serving the Willistown community in place for hopefully a very long time. In short order, we had formed our first board of trustees and hired Mary Hunt as our first staff person to help with land protection projects. Peter isn't shown in this picture because he was taking the photograph. We moved our office from the old blacksmith shop at Whitehorse Corner that had no bathroom, and it's depicted in this painting, across the road to what had been the old Whitehorse saddle shop. They hey, had a bathroom. Hey, Vaughn, you gotta yeah. tell everybody the artist, the artist's um, name. All right, Alice, yes, the artist was my dear mother. So fast forward over the next few years with Peter Strawbridge as our illustrious board chair and the addition of staff, many landowners continued to donate conservation easements, increasing the oasis of protected lands every year and creating a reservoir of preserved lands that would later spawn the robust programs that we enjoy today, such as the Russian community farm, the bird program, habitat reg restoration and watershed protection. Alice will share more on, on the significance of these vital programs in just a little bit. During those years, we also had a lot of fun celebrating the countryside and conservation successes with delightful events such as Run Amok and the Countryside Bash. These events were enjoyed by the local community and also drew many friends from afar who reveled in the joy of our increasing open spaces. It was then that the Willistown area became known as the Black Hole by pilots flying overhead. And those are the years that with support from public and private partners to include Willistown Township, Chester County, Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, the Pew Charitable, Pro the Pew Charitable Trust, the Haas Foundation, National Audubon Society, and many individuals that we began the important work of increasing and adding new preserves, providing more access and welcoming places for the community and beyond to enjoy. Sharing our mantra that conservation is for everyone, the Willistown Open Space Bond issue enabled a partnership to expand the Okahawking Preserve down on Route 3. And along with county and state funding, helped acquire the 85-acre Kirkwood Preserve on Grub Mill Road. You can see all the preserves pulled out on this map. The Kirkwood Preserve was an integral part of the 350-acre Kirkwood Farm Community Conservation Partnership acquisition that had the added benefit of allowing us to move the trust headquarters to its present site at 925 Providence Road. There's our sweet farmhouse. Additional partnerships with Chester County and DCNR helped acquire two more preserves, the beautiful 55 acre Ashbridge Preserve along the Redley Creek, just over the border in East Goshen Township, where much of our watershed research takes place and the 85 acre Russian Woods Preserve, home to our farm, bird, and watershed programs, as well as the Little White Farmhouse and the new Russian Conservation Center building. The most recent preserve addition is the exquisitely beautiful Woodpecker Woods, 33 acres located on Garrett Mill Road, donated by a dear friend and neighbor of the trust. Woodpecker Woods is not yet open to the public, but stay tuned, you are in for a real treat when it becomes accessible. Alice will share the significance of the changes that have come about as the trust has evolved from the years of primarily preserving land to the opportunities to connect people of all ages and backgrounds with nature through our preserves and programs. Alice. Thanks, Bon. So our mission statement 
includes words about sharing these unique resources with people of all ages and backgrounds. It also talks about inspiring, educating, and developing a lifelong commitment to the land and the natural world. Our preserves underpin all our outreach efforts and are the key to our ability to do all the programs we have initiated over the years. Without the preserves, we would not have been able to develop such exceptional programs. Those would include the bird program, the farm, habitat, stewardship, and the watershed programs. Rushton Woods, Kirkwood, and Ashbridge, and our newly acquired Woodpecker Woods all have contributed to our efforts to share, inspire, and educate as promised in our mission statement. The Trust Holistic approach to land co conservation with a focus on the, the connections tying the land, the farm, the birds, and the water serves to protect the native habitat and provides open space for our earth to heal and for people to enjoy. The farm is a good example, encouraging pollinators by leaving the native vegetation, which helps support the crops at the farm. Our programs have both a community reach and in many cases, a much broader reach. Take for example, the bird program that Lisa Kieschuk, our director of bird conservation leads. It includes a far reaching initiative called MODIS that helps scientists track track migrating birds in a way that has yielded new and more information, including the health of their populations, and by extension, of course, the health of the environment. Lisa brought this program to the trust and has helped put WCT on the map, really. So here's the, the, all the birding team, and they are a force. Rushton Woods is the home of that program, along with the bird banding, and along with the bird banding has extended our outreach exponentially. Lisa has developed a bird banding program for songbirds in the spring and fall, and a sawwood owl banding program uh, just happening in the fall. In addition, we have an aff uh, affiliation as a field study site with the Academy of Natural Science an exciting partnership for research and education. Blake Gull, our education program manager, also an important member of the bird conservation team with solid knowledge and the writing skill, skills to communicate is, is shown here, is also a really important member. And she's shown here, she's uh, measuring uh, and banding a sawwood owl and I have to just say that even the most die-hard birders say that's the cutest owl. They call them cute, and that's kind of amazing. Rushton Farm occupies six acres of tillable land at the Rushton Woods Preserve. Fred DeLong is the director and a very skilled farmer also. The farm is a community magnet with a CSA at its core, but it has an outreach as well in the donative intent it adopted very early on. Every week in season, Fred takes a truckload of food to the Westchester food cupboard. Here's a picture of him delivering food with Lisa's daughter, Katerina. The farm has been an educational tool from the start with farm interns, educational seminars on nutrition and outreach programs for kids for communities like Chester. That would be Chester, PA. We have extended our reach further with the new Rushton Conservation Center. This is a new addition to the Rushton Woods Preserve. It was finished in 2018 and designed to host educational events, seminars, community gatherings, and farm to table dinners, all connected to our mission. For instance, we have used the certified kitchen as a learning tool for nutritious cooking demonstrations, often using the produce directly from the farm. The Rushton Conservation Center also houses the watershed program. This is a relatively new program helping us to round out our 360 view. It's led by Lauren McGrath and some dedicated co-op students. They examine the health of our watersheds in our program area, again, Ridley, Crum, and Darby. Their findings are based on the flora and fauna present in the water. 
the information is sent to a shared database that furthers our knowledge about water quality. It's an important program. We are grateful to the William Penn Foundation for their help and guidance with this program. Andrew Kirkpatrick leads our stewardship team. He and Mike Cranny manage our preserves, monitor our easements, and our, repair our trails. And I'd just like to mention that we have so many wonderful public trails in our program area. I hope you all get a chance to, to try them out. They also educate the public and our uh, easement holders about good land management practices. The other night, Andrew and Mike did a fabulous virtual seminar on trail building and repair. It has been recorded, so check it out on our website. It's really professional, it was great. Each of our preserves is unique. We wanna welcome everyone near and far to come and explore our outdoors. So many other staff members support these efforts behind the scene. We are so lucky to have them and we need to do another Zoom a webinar to highlight their efforts as well. For the moment, though, uh, I want to go back to our mission statement where we began and our desire to bring in more people to nature. We at the Trust have form, formed a diversity, equity, and inclusion task force that will examine how we can all benefit, benefit from reaching out and bringing people of all backgrounds to nature. We are working on the idea of hosting a forum for those community members who have expressed an interest in getting involved. We feel this is an important to the long-term health of our movement and of course, to our trust. We just wanted to share with this with all of you, so please stay tuned. As Bonnie said in the beginning, the families who came forward and preserved their properties understood the greater significance of land preservation to our water, to our natural habitats, and to our wildlife. They set the pace for future land conservation in our area. We are so grateful to those families who came forward. As you have heard tonight, we have all been the beneficiaries. But we have so much more to do, and I'm going to pass you back to Bonnie and Eric to talk for a moment about how we tackle the future of land preservation in our area. Thanks so much. Bonnie? So just sharing the history and these stories with you reminds Alice and me how many caring people, landowners, donors, volunteers, community partnerships, and dedicated staff it has taken to bring us to where we are today. A beautiful oasis of over 7,500 acres of open space and the myriad opportunities that it has spawned to connect people with nature. It's been a fun, it's been fun revisiting this past with you, but it is so important to look to the future as we face new and urgent challenges to our environment and remaining open spaces. There is so much more work to be done as preserving land and habitat becomes more important than ever. Eric Hetzel, who introduced us at the beginning, is our dedicated, passionate, and skilled Director of Land Protection. Eric will wrap up the presentation by sharing his goals for the future, after which we will close and gladly welcome any questions from any of you. Eric? Uh-oh. Eric, are you there? There we go. I so, hello again, everybody. Uh, I'm Eric, and as Director of Land Protection, it's my job, along with our GIS mapping specialist, Sue Costello, to get the remaining 4,000 acres in our program area into conservation. This map shows in pink the many targeted properties that we would like to see uh, under, into conservation. Uh, it sounds ambitious, but we're optimistic that with the support of our community, we can turn this map green. I'm the person here at the at Wolfstown Conservation Trust that you'd talk to if you're interested in learning how you or somebody you know can conserve your property and become a part of this incredible movement and community. I don't wanna hold up the open discussion portion of our program here tonight, so I'm just going to ask anybody who's interested in learning more about the nuts and bolts of land protection to reach out to me directly by calling the number on your screen or sending me a direct email at the address shown here. 
I'd be help, happy to help you evaluate your individual property and talk about a conservation vision for your land. Or if you just have questions about the process, I'm here with the answers you need. If you'd like to read more about how conservation easements work, just let me know and I'll send you a copy of Here of the Willistown Countryside. This is the Landowner's Guide to Conservation Easements. And here's everything you'll need to know about starting the conversation about conservation. I'll put my, con my contact information up again at the end of the uh, program so you can uh, reach out to me if you're interested. Without further ado, let's open the floor to discussion. Uh, now we'll bring all the attendees into the meeting. The video will be off to, uh, by default. So if you'd like to be seen on screen, you'll need to click the start video button on the bottom of your screen so we can see you. I think Chelsea will be doing that now. It's a very silent crowd. I hope we have a few questions. So feel free to enter questions into the chat or, or um, unmute yourself and, and start talking to us. What do you see as the history of the or uh, the future of the Ruston Conservation Center? What do you wish to do with it? Who wants to answer that? Uh, do I have to unmute myself here? No, you're, 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 you're doing okay. it. Oh, well, thanks for that question, Dick. Um, well, I think our vision is multiple. Um, I think the huge vision, the big vision, is to have it be a place where people can come to have discussions about the really significant environmental questions that are on everybody's mind now. Perhaps to come talk about climate change, um, uh, issues like that, maybe the greater um, issues in bird conservation, um, to talk about our MODIS project, for instance. Um, we had been planning to have a major conference there before the coronavirus set in with ornithologists from throughout the Americas to talk about the future of MODIS. Um, so the building serves itself very well to that kind of thing. So it's kind of that thing all the way down to kindergarten children who can come collect vegetables on the farm and come in and learn uh, where they came from and how to prepare them and that sort of thing. So. It's a wonderful building and it has a great ambience and we're just so sad that it's sitting there um, not being used right now, but that will change. Thanks for the question. Thank you. It does make a wonderful chimney swift tower though. Ah. <laughs> yeah, thanks, for not not, thanks for not capping the chimney. That's right. <laughs> so are I, there I, I have a question, Bonnie. It's, it's Peter Strawbridge. Of the 28,000 acres, which we think of as being our program area, and the 7,500 that we have preserved as a result of the wonderful work you have done, realistically, what percentage, roughly, of the uneased land do you think it's, it's realistic to be able to preserve? Wow, Peter, that's a powerful question. Um, all of it, of course, all of it. <laughs> it's only 4,000 acres. Uh, no, I'm joking. Um, I think we'll have a good chance at preserving it all. Um, many of those larger properties that are left are institutional, such as a golf course. Um, and so the opportunity doesn't come up often to preserve properties like that, but um, we'll be ready when and if it does. Um, and several large local landowners are still thinking about preserving their lands. So I think as um, Eric is the boots on the ground and we get more and more um, 
people moving into the community who are passionate about preserving the land, I, I think we'll have a good chance at preserving most of that. Well, this isn't a question, but I just have one comment that I cannot help but make. Listening to the presentation that you and, <clears throat> and Eric and Alice made makes me so astonished at what you guys have been able to accomplish to the point where it almost makes me tear up. And I just want to thank you on behalf of so many of us who are so lucky to live in this area for what you guys have done. Well, thank you, Peter. You were a very big part of that, as, as you know. We have a question in the chat uh, from Brooke Gardner. Um, can you talk a bit about the conservation of Radnor Hunt and the role of the equestrian community in cool. land protection? Alice, do you want to take a shot at that? You can talk about that. Well, um, that was a project that was really an, an interesting one, but uh, it was a challenging one as well. Um, I mean, th this area was actually, initially, people came out here for equestrian purposes, and uh, we, uh, and and it developed after after a while, you know, uh, others came out as well, such as Peter and myself. But um, it was a tough decision for the uh, for the community to make about whether to restrict this land, the members. the members, whether to restrict this land in perpetuity. But they came through, and it was. Um, um, I mean, it, it turned out to be a very good thing, but it was a tough thing, I'll tell you that. And I, I would add that it's a great tribute to the members of Radnor Hunt and, the, um, and that community that um, they spent so much time carefully planning the easement that went on the property. It's, um, remind me, Britt, how many acres it is? I think it's 100 and, 120 acres. Um, and a very, very important piece of land, dead, dead smack in the heart of the countryside. And um, look what it's done. It's, it's been, you know, the, the centerpiece for the Radnor races. Um, it's been just a beautiful place for the community and um, just an anchor in the middle of everything. And it has drawn um, equestrians from all over um, with the races and the the horse trials and um, we owe a lot to the equestrian community um, and I think it goes both ways where we've preserved land so it is attractive to people who want Ooh, to come out, it's great. come out to the country and ride. I don't know why. Hi Liz. Hi I don't know why we suddenly popped up. Ah. <laughs> Hi Bon. I agree with Peter. I, I I, who get emotional all the time, I, all of the stuff that you are doing this week, I did the aerial view of all the lands that you have saved, and it, it, is, it is very emotional for me, and it is touching, and I'm so proud of you, and Alice, and Lisa, and, Ri and, and Dick, and Eric, and and everybody Fred. up there, and all the people up there. Yeah. And Fred, obviously. Oh, thanks, Liz. May I say something briefly? Oh, never say anything briefly, but go ahead. <laughs> we have a wonderful staff, exceptional staff, and that is a reflection of the leaders in part of the trust that we have to work with. So we have our palette, and we have the talent and we need to make it all come together and continue to come together to make it all work. And I will say about the, the equestrians, uh, I like to get out every day and, and run the trails or walk the trails or whatever. And uh, frequently, very frequently, I hear the horns mm -hmm. and I hear the, the horses uh, off in the woods 
And today I got a glimpse of the hounds. So tomorrow, maybe I'll see a fox. <laughs> Thank you all. Is that your refrigerator behind you? That's my shell collection. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have, a, we have a question from Kathy Warden in the chat. What are the criteria for establishing a preserve like Kirkwood? I think it's better to have more for public access. Are there more larger tracks that can, that can be converted to a, quote, preserve status? Kathy, I think that's a really interesting question. And we've been very lucky because most of the preserves have evolved as part of one or another of these community partnership projects where we've acquired property. And we've been able to plan these large parcels, these large tracks out, uh, leaving the most sensitive areas um, and raising public funds to preserve those most sensitive areas. So Ashbridge, for instance, the, the, um, the Riddle Tree came down through the middle of it and we were able to save 55 acres while selling the surrounding areas to private individuals. In the, in the uh, case of the Woodpecker Woods, um, it was just one amazing friend and, and landowner who never wanted to see anything happen on her precious land and just outright donated it to us. So um, we'll keep working at creating more preserves in the future um, <coughs> as the opportunities arise. Great question. I'd like to know what the impact of your programs has had on the animal life in the area. Alice, answer that one. <laughs> well, I had a beaver last year. <laughs> and I, I should say we, but I was an advocate for the beaver and somebody else was not. Um, but, um, hmm. Uh, it's a great place for deer at the moment, as we all know. So that's, uh, but uh, I think Lisa would be best to talk about, or Dick, or about the, the bird populations. That's what to me is so exciting. And I'd love to hear from them about that. Go ahead, Lisa. Go on. Well, you know, we just banded our hundredth species uh, last week. So Rushton is definitely a magnet for migratory birds, along with breeding birds, and of course our favorite saw wet owls, which Alice mentioned. Um, but the, the, the trouble, and our numbers have been going up recently, but the troubling piece of that is um, they could be going up because development is, is increasing in, our, in the surrounding areas around Willistown, as you all notice when you're driving down Westchester Pike towards Newtown Square. And so it's, it's important to, to, if you are gonna conserve your land and with the conserved land that we have is to make that habitat as rich as possible so that what's left is, is high, highly valuable to these birds and species that are using it. But I, I think if it weren't for Willistown, there'd be a lot less birds in the world. That's what I think. <laughs> well, one, of the, one of the strange, strange measures of, of this might be uh, the fact that Rushton is actually becoming kind of a bird birders um, destination uh, is being recognized uh, among the birders, uh, local birders as a place that you go to, to see both the usual and uh, the possibly unusual birds that come through. So um, regardless of what's happening to the bird population locally or statewide or, or, or national, uh, we're doing our bit uh, to, to preserve the, the birds uh, of the world. I've got a question or comment. Can I jump in? Sure. Eric. I, I, <laughs> That's I, this, is, this is not bird related, strangely enough, but it has to do with the uh, with easements. And uh, could you say a word or two, or uh, uh, Bonnie, uh, Alice, to say a word or two about small donations, that, you know, that you don't have to have 100 acres to, to, to be an easement. That's a question for you, Eric. Yeah, there are, there are a few things about smaller properties. Uh, it's true, you don't need 100 acres, you don't need 50 acres uh, to 
gain a, uh, to be able to donate an easement. In fact, um, in Willistown, we have four acre zoning throughout most of our township, which means that um, all you really need is eight to 12 to 16 acres in order to uh, be able to gain a tax deductible donation by giving up building rights. Because that means if four acre minimum zoning means that's the smallest lot size you need to build a, to build a, a, a home site. Um, in addition to that, we also have a newer program that we call our legacy easement program, which allows people to donate a conservation easement on any size property. Um, it's really a streamlined easement document that um, it's really designed for properties that may not qualify uh, for a tax deduction under the normal conservation easement scenario. It still meets all the legal criteria to be a valid conservation easement in terms of uh, the state of Pennsylvania um, from a federal easement standpoint. It's just not designed to be a tax deductible donation. So really anybody with any size property can donate an easement and uh, promote the le their legacy of conservation for generations to come. I don't know, Bonnie, do you have anything to add to that about? Well, I just wanted to say that legacy easements that have been donated really complete the fabric of the um, preserved land in our area. So we never want to think that, have people think that their property is too small because every single easement adds to protecting um, habitat or whatever it is that's special about a person's property. Um, so we, we welcome and really encourage legacy easement donors. And I, I just said to that, uh, as Bonnie mentioned, sort of fills in the fabric of conserved lands. Uh, very important thing in habitat preservation and protection is providing uh, greenways and pathways for wildlife to exist in our countryside and by filling in some of those open areas, uh, it connects larger tracts and larger areas of protected land. So the more when we get connected in between the bigger pieces, the more that promotes uh, wildlife integrity and habitat. And we have some more questions in the chat uh, from Barbara Vincent. How's the trust surviving the pandemic? Can you support the staff without Barnes and Barbecue run amok? Is it Chelsea or Kate, are you there? Well, yep. we can, oh, there you go, Kate. <laughs> How about answering that, Kate? <clears throat> um, but, um, we are surviving and thriving during these unusual times. Um, we have certainly noticed that, um, you know, nature does not close. Nature has not stopped. Um, so all of our program staff have been out in the field doing their field work, um, very busy. Um, and our preserves have been busier than ever, um, which is amazing to see people getting out and connecting with nature, um, enjoying their conserved open space um, here in their backyard where they can't go other places. Um, so I will also say that we've had such a wonderful um, response from our community in terms of fundraising. Um, we've had people contributing. Um, we've, we've transitioned most of our in-person events to these virtual um, Zoom events. We've got a great lineup and they're all recorded. They're on our website. Um, so I encourage you to check those out and, and learn something from each of our program areas. Um, and we've been very fortunate to have um, our, our loyal community here supporting us throughout and along the way. So um, we're not worried. Um, and so you shouldn't be either. And um, feel free to jump in and add anything else, Chelsea or Trip. But I think we're um, 
We're just overwhelmed and excited by the response of our community to transitioning to these virtual events and connecting with new members of our community in different ways. Um, that's it. <laughs> Kate, do you mind if I just add one thing? Yeah. I will say that, um, Kate, as you so eloquently added, that we've been able to pivot and um, due to the amazing staff, had, had, had such strong um, turnout for these virtual events, et cetera. But for those of you on the call, if you're new, we really encourage you to get more involved. Um, and for those of you that are, um, have been around for a long time, you know, please continue to bring in new people. And of course, um, the backbone of the organization financially is our annual fund. Um, and so if anybody is considering helping the trust or would like to in the future, um, that's one outlet to make a donation. And of course, volunteerism is still extremely important. And there's a link on our website to volunteer. So hop on there, check out the future events and help us make a difference. Excellent. Thank you, Tripp. We have another question in the chat. This is from Louise. Do our other townships in Chester County come to you for advice on how to preserve their land? Your success in long-term planning should be modeled by others. Well, we certainly think so that we have a very uh, model-worthy process here. Uh, I'm not aware of any other townships that really have come to us. Um, Bonnie, do you have any recollection that other townships outside of the three, the several that we work in. Uh. Yeah, um, I mean, we have we have done some consulting. Um, we're not as far ranging, obviously, as Brandywine Conservancy as far as our consulting goes. Um, but uh, we have gone up to Charlestown Township and uh, West Vincent and other townships just to help them out and try to get started with programs of their own. So um, that's yeah, that answers that, I think. Yep. And I add to that, um, I have been in contact with somebody who's involved in doing land trust work out in New Mexico, who was interested in implementing our legacy easement model out there. Uh, they see that as an innovative way to preserve uh, land in, in different ways out there as well. So that's, that's pretty exciting knowing that, that we're receiving some, uh, some national attention on that front. Eric. Uh, don't forget all the work that you're doing with municipalities such as Malvin. That would be uh, Andrew Kirkpatrick um, working with the Malvern um, task force to develop a master plan for Randolph Woods. We hold the easement on that park that's owned by Malvern Borough. And as part of that, we're an important stakeholder. So Andrew Kirkpatrick has been working with them. He's part of that task force meeting regularly to figure out the best way for the borough to use that uh, currently underutilized uh, public open space. So that's, that's true. We do work in that capacity as well. And I'd add that prior to Andrew, uh, Bill Hartman helped with the Malvern Willistown Greenway project, uh, which is a, a major project that we consulted on. And that's how the Randolph Woods really came about at that, at that time, so. That's right. Okay, do we have any more questions out there? Uh, a nice message from Ellen Ferretti. Thank you so much, Ellen. We always have the Brandywine Conservancy high bar to try to measure up to. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. I, I, I wonder why I'm the only one Kathy. drinking wine. Hey, Kathy. Hi, I just wanted to say what started as a dream has turned into something absolutely amazing. I'm so impressed with all of you, everybody up there, uh, and especially all your hard work. It's just incredible. It's just a dream come true. For uh, two young girls who everybody said it was impossible, you did it. <laughs> So, well, and then Kathy went west and did it all over again. Well, that's true. Right. I, you were talking about using as a model. I used as a model when I got to Steamboat Springs um, to start the land trust out there uh, based on what Bonnie and I did. Uh, and I ran into some, some pretty hard heads out there in cowboy land. Uh, so, but it all came through and it's, it's just been a real experience. But I'm really so glad to see this 
just advance and go so far. I mean, it's really terrific. So congratulations. Thanks, Kathy. On that note, could you highlight the influence the, the trust has had in other areas, farm areas, bird, <clears throat> around the world outside our confined area? Talking, giving lectures. Uh, I, I see what you mean. Um, well, our, our staff is constantly out talking at different conferences and um, events. Um, Fred, uh, is Fred on board here? Uh, no, he, he, he just ran out to take a shower because they just got <laughs> <laughs> okay. which is a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, Fred, for instance, has been up to the Yale conference um, on um, conservation numerous times and talked about our programs. Um, Lisa has been to bird programs all over the world, really. Um, and so we do have a broad reach. Um, I don't know, Lisa, do you want to speak a little bit more about the different places you've been in Alaska and um, yeah. Maine? Or? I mean, the MODIS project, you know, the, the wildlife tracking project has, we're now the, we're the largest collaborator in, in um, the United States and the second largest next to Birds Canada. And it, the COVID problem actually brought us closer to scientists from all over the world. I've never met so many, you know, ornithologists in all my life. And I feel connected now to the West, to the Midwest, to South America, Central America. It's been amazing. And, uh, you know, to have, I always say this, that a little land trust, not, not little, I mean, but a local land trust like Willistown Conservation Trust to get millions of dollars in grant money from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, that's virtually unheard of. Um, I don't think it's ever been done, to be quite honest. So that is kudos to, to Bonnie for allowing her staff to go crazy. <laughs> no, I mean, to, to be creative and, and, you know, do what, do what seems right. But that's that, and the fact that we we partnered with state agencies throughout the Mid Atlantic, including New England now, and it's just great to be. I think Modis is just um, one example of everyone working together, whereas before everyone was kind of working in their own little regions, and now everyone's working together because, as you know, the the statistics coming out about wildlife are are pretty dire, and the only way to to fix any of these issues is to work together. Um, throughout the world, not to isolate ourselves from the world. That's, birds don't birds don't see borders. I don't. I'm not sure why humans do, but that's that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> yeah, well said, Lisa. <clears throat> Even the suggestion that I could have harnessed you anyway is ridiculous. <laughs> Sorry. It's <laughs> true. Okay. So um, it's now. Seven o'clock almost. Uh, should we wrap it up? Um, are there any other urgent questions? Eric? I'm just gonna share my screen once again. Uh, up there is my contact information. If you would like to reach out to me uh, to learn more about conservation easements or have any questions at all about land protection in our organization. Uh, be happy to send you a copy of our Heroes of the Countryside. And um, with that, I guess it's a wrap. I appreciate everybody being here tonight. If anybody has any more questions. Um, and thank you so much, every single one of you, for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good night. Good show. Thank you. Thanks, Dick. Thank well you. done. Bye, guys. So long. Thank you. <laughs>